Chapter 8, Passively Acquired Cultural Trait, or Pact. So, quote, So homosexuality and heterosexuality are fictions? Yes, of course. He adopts a camp voice and adds, But it makes a lot of girls happy. Why do so many people believe it to be true about themselves if it's false? They believe in Jesus, and that's a much bigger fiction, with more money spent on it. Prettier close to, end quote. Until recently, same-sex relationships have been illegal in the West, and certain relationships are still de jure illegal. In Leningrad, the comrades have begun to arrest activists for so-called homosexual propaganda, which would presumably include this very work and many of its sources. But why aren't today's legal and cultural barriers to Guerrero not considered situational? Hypocrisy and a piss-poor grasp of logic. With Christopher Hitchens, that he went to an all-male boarding school is situational to his relationship. Apparently, he couldn't sneak out on the weekends and never learned how to masturbate. But that he and his friend were threatened with expulsion and forbidden to talk to each other, that's not situational. Exclusive heterosexuality is so fragile, people have to be threatened to stop doing what is allegedly so obviously unnatural, a, contradict a contradiction if there ever was one. One reviewer speaks of Hitchens' revelations as a window into horny teenage bi curiosity, concluding that, quote, the horniness of teenagers is a force greater than sexual orientation, end quote, in that great style of castrating heterosexuality of any coherent meaning and belittling genuine same-sex desires. The fact that Hitchens remember the episode fondly and that he was forbidden to pursue it further speaks against the idea that it was some temporary madness caused by instinctual horniness that, again, neither women nor masturbation could cure. And, of course, if, Hitch if Hitchens had been caught with a girl, told never to speak to her again, and then had a same-sex relationships, you can bet anything the clueless hypocrites would start screeching about situational this and that caused by the artificial pussy prohibition. When Luke and Stephen were separated forcefully by the latter's father, why isn't that situational? If Stephen's father was not indoctrinated by his culture to be a homophobic asshat bigot, do we really think the relationship would have ended then? Maybe at some other point, as relationships do end, but no one would dare say the attraction was never really there or the potential for future similar masculine-on-masculine -masculine relationship wasn't there either. After Gore Vidal penned The City and the Pillar, the New York Times refused to review his books. Surely, trying to limit people's options creates a situation. But of course, not when same-sex anything is limited. And then, when the gays hold a pride parade once a year, the bigots say the fags are the ones pushing their agenda down everyone's throats. Any less self-awareness and such bigots risk classification as a pillar of salt. What about the realization in three of the excerpts quoted? If you missed it, read, read them again. Luke, Bob, and Scott all realize that society is against what they feel and internalize this. I have to admit, although I was conflicted about the nature of our relationship, I was over the moon. You know, that was awful kid stuff we did. Well, it was different than with a girl, and I don't think it's right. I only have sex with a guy for money, and two guys can't love each other." End quote. There was hesitancy in pursuing the relationship thanks to the effects of culture raping their minds. But what could be more natural than doing something that is expressly forbidden? The act of going against the mandatory shows its naturalness. That the love between young men is quite natural is proved every time it happens, especially when expressly forbidden. What could be more natural than doing the prohibited in spite of its prohibition? This very, this very stigma, such secretive relationships overcome, for a while at least, proves Guerrero is deep-seated, not situational. One such example of the cultural tide Guerrero has been drowning under shows a police officer propagandizing moral puritanism to middle high school students in the 1960s. There may be some in this auditorium. There may be some here today that will be homosexual in the future. There are a lot of kids here. There may be some girls that'll turn lesbian. We don't know. But it's serious. Don't kid yourselves about it. They can be anywhere. They can be judges, lawyers. We ought to know we've arrested all of them. So if any one of you 
have let yourself become involved with an adult homosexual or with another boy, and you're doing this on a regular basis, you better stop quick. Because one out of three of you will turn queer. And if we catch you involved with a homosexual, your parents are going to know about it first. And you will be caught. Don't think you won't be caught. Because this is one thing you cannot get away with. This is one thing that if you don't get caught by us, you'll be caught by yourself. And the rest of your life will be a living hell. We have to take for granted that Christians drive people away from same-sex relationships by threatening them with hellfire. That's perfectly okay and natural because that's how it's always been, except when it wasn't. A society that threatens young men with prison hellfire and shame isn't situational, and neither are nagging mothers who demand grandchildren, or every commercial that promotes exclusive heterosexuality with a Pavlovian prompt of busty women reinforcing what a man's only goal ought to be or every other commercial that belittles Grero by regurgitating the cultural line that intimacy between men is at best an uncomfortable punchline. Remember those awful Snickers commercials? What a coincidence that the only time situationality comes up is when same-sex attractions are encouraged or opposite-sex attraction downplayed. What a further coincidence that this makes our culture at large, save for those, save for those pesky counterexamples, completely unbiased and unsituational. Oh, our culture is the yardstick against which all should be measured. Distilled to its simplicity, some situations are situational, some situations are not situational. Is there a better example of ethnocentric arrogance than this double think? The dominant culture is not a culture, it is an unmarked given. Woe unto those her uh, heretical perverts who dare expose this. This is why Wikipedia has various categories for LGBT writers, athletes, politicians, etc., but not a single one for heterosexual anyones. Some readers may still be confused as to why certain situations are situational, but not others. Here's a helpful chart in making the correct assessment. A situation that increases same-sex sex is situational. Examples of this are cultures of all times and eras. A situation that decreases same-sex sex is not situational. Christians threatening hellfire, for example. A situation that increases opposite sex sex is not situational. For example, nag mothers wanting grandkids. A situation that decreases opposite sex sex is situational. For example, boarding schools, militaries, prisons. This bias of marked same-sex sex while heterosexual sex remains the unmarked default shows even in today's politically correct climate. A 2011 article on a mainstream news site about new revelations concerning serial killer John Wayne Gacy says the following, quote, Due to Gacy's highly publicized homosexuality and pattern of preying on vulnerable teams, teens, detectives believe the passage of time might actually work in their favor, end quote. Would we ever see an article mention Ted Bundy's highly publicized heterosexuality as he preferred to rape and kill only women? Heterosexuality is hidden. The gay debate is stuck between choice and the deterministic genes or hormones. But what about the unseen manipulative hand of culture? We can point out the biases of other cultures, but we are blind to our own. That's why anti grero or heterosexuality is never situational, while pro grero pro-gay, and anti-heterosexual is always situational. Girlfriends demanding exclusivity in weddings? Not situational. Nagging girlfriends demanding exclusivity in weddings, which leads to men to try out other men? Situational. Take the clothing you own. Am I correct to guess that your wardrobe includes neither a top hat nor a monocle? How strange, indubitably. We're generally not forced to wear any specific kind of clothing, save for work, yet culture clearly reduces your choices to a small subset of acceptable norms without your knowledge. That's why Roman togas are funny, but you don't laugh every time you look in the mirror. Exclusive heterosexuality is a passively acquired cultural trait, or pact. You don't remember signing up? That's the point. 
And like the Warsaw Pact, if you try to leave, there will be severe consequences. Anyways, while humans have a unique capacity for language, no one chooses what language they first learn. Situational homosexuality is the linguistic equivalent of claiming that if you grow up speaking English, you are oriented towards English. Evidence of knowing French by later learning it is merely situational. You weren't born to speak French, but can do so under certain circumstances. But what if you were raised in a culture that spoke French? Most humans have a capacity for language, but not a capacity for a single language per se. No one woke up this morning and chose not to wear a top hat with a monocle. Culture took away that choice for you. Pact is, near, is not merely about sexuality. It's about examining whether our values and beliefs are our own or just the product of the hidden white noise stealthily infiltrating our brains without our conscious knowledge. It's rather uncomfortable that all our deeply held beliefs could be false or were, or were acquired passively. Time to disengage the autopilot or at the very least recognize that there is one running the show. As the basic unit of culture is people, especially parents, teachers, peers, Grero is especially hard. Grero is not just I like men, but you like men. It is a spit in the face of culture followed by a backhanded slap. Grero is not easy, but it is true. We have to conclude that, in fact, it is our current homophobic culture that's situational in that it denies the long and proud history of masculine-masculine love by replacing it with a circular sophistry of situational homosexuality that assumes what it fails to prove. Far from situational homosexuality representing an exception to most men's nature, it is our culture that's the exception to our real nature. But even in the world of same-sex pornography, the lie lives on. Sausage jockeys tossing salads. Halperin notes that, quote, because we do not tend to see our own sexual categories as arbitrary or conventional, and because we regard them accordingly as empty of ideological content, we consider homosexual and heterosexual to be purely descriptive transcultural and transhistorical terms equally applicable to every culture and period." End quote. Hence, the constant anachronistic usage of homosexual and heterosexual to describe the Greeks, pigeonholing them into one or the other instead of neither or at the most, a concession that while the Greeks did not use our current dichotomy and may not have been entirely straight, they're definitely not gay or homosexual at all. This adoption of the binary hetero-homo system extends to those who should know better as they have experienced relationships that do transcend this evil dichotomy. Take Christopher Hitchens. In an interview, he gave, he gave this as a reason for revealing his boarding school affair with another male student. I decided I'd put this in the book because they used to be such a staple of English biography. So I thought it might be as well if, if more heterosexual guys said what most of them could, that they too have known what it's like to feel involved emotionally as well with a member of their own sex. It might be a wholesome thing. It would clear the air. Um, because, um, as I never tire of saying, I mean, it's a form of love, not just a form of sex. Contradicting the tenets of, sex, of situational homosexuality, Hitchens clearly recognized that his relationship wasn't just about sex, yet he himself still claimed to be heterosexual. Quite frustrating. This maddening lack of self-awareness reaches its peak with so-called gay porn stars, though at the entire topic of sexual situationality, the now carefully trained reader will easily spot the contradictions and irate and irate irately yell them out to the discomfort of nearby individuals. The excuses center around the negating effect of money on the essence of one's being. Namely, if you get paid to have sex with another man, you're not defined by it and you're not a homosexual. As another equally valid example, because a doctor gets paid to perform surgery, he's not really a doctor. Everyone knows that. It's common sense. And of course, when your friends find out that you have performed surgeries, you have to nervously explain that that, that was merely a series of youthful indiscretions meant only to pay the bills. Take Aaron, who tells Tyra Banks that he's straight but gay for pay, much to Tyra's amusement, who had not heard the phrase before the day's show. Aaron, Aaron needs the money and swears he'll stop when he gets married, just like smoking or leaving the toilet seat up. 
He started out as a male stripper for women and then dabbled in straight porn. But straight porn just doesn't pay enough to get him through college. Quoting probably his proud mother, Aaron rhetorically asks, how can you say no to something that you've never tried? End quote. Then he tells us that to make the same money in one scene with a guy, he would have to fuck 20 women. So the new definition of heterosexuality is, I'd rather sleep with one guy than 20 women. Think of the time saved that you could spend on continuing to not have sex with women. On the same show, Tyra Banks trots out Dean, who does stuff with other guys, kisses guys, but he's just acting. You know, he needs the money. He doesn't get aroused, not really. The audience hisses in disbelief. Dean considers himself 100% straight, absolutely, despite kissing other guys for money, but then pops out from the audience, Courtney, his bisexual girlfriend. I have a little different interpretation, I guess, of sexuality. <laughs> I love him. I know that he's heterosexual, but I also think he's a little bit bisexual. I just don't think that you could do what he does and not be somewhat bisexual. Um, but he has a different opinion of that. He thinks that if he doesn't go out on his own searching for men, going to bars and whatnot, and trying to do that in his personal life, that that, doesn't make, that makes him not gay, that he's heterosexual. The only because he's doing it for money that he thinks he's that he's hetero or he's gay for pay or whatever. But I just you know he does it, so I think he's bisexual. Finally, someone with a lucid thought who comes close to understanding Guerrero, albeit clumsily grasping onto the current framework and its outdated terminology like bisexual. George DeRoy, the legendary porn director of Bellamy, concurs. Talking about the importance of his company not appearing too gay. He notes in an inter interview with a now-funked Manshots magazine, quote, DeRoy, if they feel it is a gay environment, it would be probably more difficult to convince them to do certain things. When they see that all the other boys who work for me are as straight as they are, they would do it. Manshots, straight, in quotes? DeRoy, it's difficult to say quotes because they might be, and they usually are, very sexual. Still, it's very difficult to say about somebody that he's gay because it's like he would be gay if he looks for other boys, if he dates another boy or whatever. And there is not that with these boys. They would be pretty much available if you ask them, I would say, under certain circumstances, but they would never be looking for it. Man shots. I understand. Available, but not aggressive. DeRoy. Yeah, I, I would say it's like it certainly wouldn't be their preference, but it's not that. You, you can see in their films... Uh, they, they do it pretty well. I dare say they enjoy it while they're doing it." End quote. A few things monkey see, monkey do. Because society has repressed the full extent of masculine sexuality, no one knows what to do. And even if they got creative, they'd know it's not permissible. But what if that ignorance and roadblock are removed? Then perhaps even their preference would change. Who needs women for sex when you don't have to wait, for an, wait an hour for the other guy to get ready? Or holding your farts for three hours on a date you would never take any of your friends to. And remember, no inappropriate remarks or jokes. Pretend you're at the sterile airport. The relationships between the sexes often reminds me of uh, Calvin and Susie playing house. Uh, maybe I'm a socially awkward penguin, but I feel like an act around women. I have, I have to be a different guy. You know, I felt the same around gay men. It's, it's as if I have to be the stereotype of a gentleman. I have to be what they want, not what I, what I am. As boys, we're given a list of what is masculine. Some of these are culturally defined, but quite a lot of gender is inborn. The last item on that list is liking only those with whom we share none of the previous masculine traits. What? As someone masculine, why is it deemed appropriate that I only like those with whom I do not share any attributes on the masculine list? I'm quite certain that other men have dealt with this better since they haven't written treatises on sexual orientation. Anyways, DeRoy is close to understanding the cultural influence nudging young men towards women, uh, nudging young men towards women and women only, but unfortunately he, he reverts to a variation of situational homosexuality to explain straight men's unexpected liking of same-sex sex. Their like of same-sex sex is not necessarily in their innate nature, but a function of being very sexual. And since they're heterosexual, another way of stating that is to say that a symptom of extreme heterosexuality results in homosexuality. The heterosexuality bucket overflows into the same-sex one. 
Or if you really like women, you'll be sure to like men. Again, real heterosexuality cannot be defined to include its opposite. DeRoy certainly comes close, but even among enlightened individuals, the bias in favor of the current framework prevails even when the first-hand evidence contradicts it. I remember a porn site a while back called FratPad. The premise was that a bunch of young guys, the frat part, who live in a big house, the pad part, uh, and have lots of sex, the porn part. In the tour of the website, a nude but flaccid but large Spencer opens the door and warmly greets us inside. As it turns out, Spencer is Dustin Zito, one of the stars of MTV's 2011 The Real World Las Vegas. Revealing his past job as a nude greeter only in a later episode, we find Dusty trying to console an upset girlfriend by downplaying the extent of his sextivities. Quote, you got taped having sex. It's all over the internet, shrieks Derpina, the girlfriend. Dusty hesitantly rationalizes, quote, I didn't get taped having sex. Yeah, yeah, okay, I got naked and stuff. By not getting taped having sex, Dustin means that there exists a tape of his mouth stuffed with a dick and his ass getting fucked. Dostoevsky should have told this shrill cunt that he likes cock and anyone who has a problem with that isn't going to get his. Instead, he knows on some level he likes men, but tries to rationalize it to conform to societal standards. For example, we see a previous clip of a drunken Dusty shouting that he believes we were put on this earth to reproduce, clearly at odds with his past employment of sucking dicks by the dozen. These unwritten and unspoken standards are set by even the allegedly liberal and hedonistic MTV. The show's co-creator and closet homophobic bigot tells us that Dusty was asked to be on the show because, quote, whether it's that particular story having done one of these voyeuristic websites or some other mistake someone's made in life, end quote, appeals to the audience. Yes, kids, having sex with other men and getting paid for it is a mistake. Don't worry, though, a man can absolve himself of this mistake by continual self-loathing and repeating the party line about the temporality of situational homosexuality. The conservatives want zero gays via pray the gay away, while the liberals don't want anything more than the token 2% effeminate minority. As a side note, MTV is not the only socially liberal entity that's more homophobic than its reputation suggests. In the Kinsey Institute New Report on Sex, uh, author June Rennish answers a question from a very upset mother who caught her son and four of his friends, friends masturbating each other in the garage. Quote, Studies, including ones conducted by the Kinsey Institute, have found that same-sex genital activity in childhood and adolescence does not predict adult homosexual behavior, end quote. Don't worry, Mom. Johnny probably ain't a feg just because he's circle-jerking half the class. Phew! And, and he especially won't become a homosexual if we tell him just how awful they are. On the surface, the idea that money overrides alleged basic instincts superficially makes a bit of sense. However, we're not living in a 19th century French novel. No one is starving and has to do strange for a piece of change. If we're on the topic of Les Miserables, yet another nasty hypocrisy must be pointed out. No one questions the sexuality of porn players and stars whose orientation matches the societal expectations. If the same-sex act is done with great vigor, it must be the money and good acting skills. If it's done hesitantly and the guy doesn't appear to enjoy it, it's obviously forced, and thus it's not his real orientation. Situational homosexuality cannot lose by calling both sides of the coin, but yet, my personal viewing of an enormous amount of porn seems to disprove these, situa these situational excuses. I've seen the same guys perform in both, uh, in both so-called straight and gay porn. Those guys who are good at one are generally good at the other. Those who appear meek and petrified in scenes with other men aren't very good at fucking women either. But it's fun to watch nonetheless. There's a certain charm in sexual awkwardness. Given that, given that the alternative to not doing gay for pay is not starvation, I'm supposed to believe that Dusty, who chooses to make a bit more money tossing salad than flipping burgers, is still functionally a heterosexual. Really? 
And again, the double standards. It's only with sex that we nervously yell about situationality. The guy who flips burgers because he may actually starve isn't a situational cook. Hey man, I, I flip burgers for money. I wasn't born a flipper. What a joke. But when it comes down to it, these porn players prefer sex with men over folding short shirts. They may be folders and flippers, but never call them tossers. Aaron, Dean, Dusty, and many others would be much happier, happier as Greros, not having to constantly make excuses for their Romanesque proclivities. And that's why Grero is important. Without the word, how does one even overcome the seemingly insurmountable numbers problem? Straight relationships rely on the unseen numbers to work. Basically, all the women a man sees are potential mates. Sure, some are ugly, some are taken, some do not like you in return, but the remaining pool of mutually interested candidates is high enough. These days, few men can be assumed to be masculine and like other men. Whereas few women are offended if you show interest, many men can be violent if propositioned. So where does a grero meet another grero? Gay bars are full of the, atten of the effeminate types, so that's out. Where else? That's a good question without any good answers yet, but at least there is a word. In high school, I only knew about the beatific story, the Kinsey numbers, and the homophobia study. From just these three, I knew even back then that the current sexual orientation framework could not be the whole truth. But who to tell and how? There is no context, no theory behind these. Culture's favorite hit, situational homosexuality, drowned it all out. I think a lot of guys would like other guys is not something for casual discussion. Neither is this work, but it's a start. This book does not turn every guy believing himself to be straight into a grero, so it does not solve this numbers problem. The propaganda of exclusive heterosexuality has solidified into the reality of exclusive heterosexuality. Grero is a scarier word than bisexual or gay. Whereas these labels describe oneself, grero makes a claim on all men. You can like all the women you want, but you still like cock. If you are open about what you like and others know, the hope is that the shy ones may reflect on Grero and gravitate towards you. Even more porn. Europeans tend to be more sensible in sexuality and elsewhere than Americans, though this difference is often overstated by both. George DeRoy, Belle Amy's porn director from the last section, had his interview with a blog. Question. I've heard lots of models are straight. Is that true? Is this a cultural difference? Because I think it's hard for some Americans to see them enjoying enthusiastic sex with men than identifying as straight. Answer. Gay porn was never dominated by gay models, and in the case of Bellamy, not even half of the employees are gay. In the last three years, we had seven babies born to our employees. Gay porn should be more accurately called all-male porn. I don't see this necessarily as a cultural difference, most of the models working for Corbin Fisher or Sean Cody are straight as well. I know some gay models in the U.S. who claim to be straight to get a job with some of the American studios. On the other hand, I can't imagine that a really straight man would be able to perform the way our models perform, no matter what they think they are. I, for one, certainly wouldn't be able to be straight for pay. We live in a world where traditional labels don't apply anymore, partly as a result of gay emancipation. Being gay is not a taboo anymore, and I'd say at least 30% of the city boys in Central European region happily experiment with their sexuality. Many enjoy it, but they won't think of themselves as being gay. They simply mingle freely, going with their girlfriends to gay bars and fondling other boys in front of girls. And now tell me, what is their orientation? Sometimes I joke saying that very few gay men are so enthusiastic during sex with other boys as these straight boys. I suspect that gay men lost their monopoly on gay sex as a part of their social acceptance, or that experimenting with all male sex is simply in, end quote. Or, all these contradictions of the current framework point towards Grero, namely, men can enjoy other men. It's as simple as that. One of Bellamy's early favorites, uh, favorites, Lucas Richstone, understood this even if he was unreflective uh, from an interview with Manshots magazine. What is your sexual preference? Do you consider yourself gay? Uh, Lucas, no, I don't. I, I never considered, uh, I, I never think about these things. I have a girlfriend, but after my scene with Johan Pollock in, in Lucas, Lucas's story too, I've realized that I can enjoy sex with a boy as well as a girl. 
I don't understand my sexuality even today. The only thing I know is that I am a very sexual person, and I don't feel any special prejudices to complicate my life. I am certainly not spending any time, my time trying to understand it. I'm just enjoying it. End quote. An interview 10 years later shows a more succinct, if still vague, acceptance. Uh, question. Do you identify as gay, straight, or bisexual? Lucas. I always say I am sexual. End quote. Or Guerrero, far from situational homosexuality rescuing heterosexuality from the counter evidence of the alleged, allegedly rare and temporary instances of male male contact, such relationships are the evidence of the Guerrero beneath the fast fading veneer of exclusive heterosexuality.